Okay, everybody, welcome to the last PowerPoint of the semester for medical terminology. This one is special senses, which uh, encompasses the eyes and the ears. So let's not delay and let's get it started. I will share my screen. And here we go. And I'm gonna minimize us. Okay, so what will we discuss tonight? We're gonna talk about the structure and function of the eye. So the outer layer of the eye, the sclera is the white portion of your eye. And basically that gives it its shape and strength. The cornea is the anterior section it's see-through. And that's where light can come in to the eye. And the conjunctiva, and I'm actually going to show my face just a little bit here. The conjunctiva is this part, right? Should be nice and pink. Uh, that's kind of a membrane. It covers the outer surface of the eye and lines your eyelids as well, okay? The middle layer of the eye, you have the vascular, the, the you know, blood-filled layer. You have the choroid, which holds the blood vessels for the eye, and there's the pigmented cell cells with color in them, which explains the iris. That's the colored portion of your eye. It's blue, it's brown, it's green, right? And it's basically an opening into the eye. And then the ciliary body is um, a small apparatus that actually produces aqueous humor. And it's not funny. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fluid-like substance that holds the bag together that contains the lens of the eye. And then inside the eye, you've got your retina. Now the retina is the thing that gets the light energy and sends it to the brain to interpret. So when you look at something, you know, you're looking at a video, the signals are just constantly and at lightning fast speed going to the brain saying, this is what you're saying, right? Um, and then you have an optic disc and that's where the optic nerve enters the eye. That's how, also called your blind spot. So there's a teeny tiny little portion that's actually, that's blind spot, but it's minuscule and so tiny that you don't even notice it's there. Fun fact. And then the accessory structures, you have eyelids, they protect your eyes, right? You will blink even if you're not trying, it's involuntary, something's coming towards you. The conjunctiva, like I talked about, it's that membrane covers the inside of the eyes and the eyelids. Uh, the lacrimal glands, those are the glands that make tears. And tears, fun, another fun fact, actually have an antimicrobial property to them. So in other words, they're almost like an antibiotic. Right? They protect your eye, they keep it moist, and they also protect it from certain you know, pathogens. And so I'm not going to go through these as far as the, this you know, anatomy of the eye. So let's go to let's go to the combining forms of the words. And so for choroid, it is cor, oops, choroido. And for retina, retinal. Or retino, so it's it's two different ones, and I'm actually going to move this, and I'm going to move me out of the way as well. Goodbye. There we go. And so retino, and then iris, iridio, irido. I'm sorry, irido, and then corneo is cornea is corneo, and. Hardening or sclera, the white of the eye, right, is the sclero. Your pupil can either be called pupilo or with the, the core word could be choreo. The lens of the eye, believe it or not, is fascio, P-H-A-C slash O. And then when we talk about light, believe it or not, it's photo. And I'll explain more about that later, like photophobia, which means the light hurts my eyes. It's actually painful. And then I did some of these. The eyelid is blepharo, the conjunctiva, conjunctivo, the angle, and that's important because of things like angular glaucoma, acute angle glaucoma, uh, is donio, and then water, Aquio, like the aqueous humor, or hydro. Both of those terms refer to water. When we talk about the eye, oculo, we talk about the cornea, which is hard tissue, it's car carito. When we talk about the lacrimal apparatus, which is kind of like the tear gland or tear duct, 
Dacrolo or Lacrimo. And then your vision can either be opto or optico. If something is gray, believe it or not, it's glauco. Think about glaucoma, because what happens is you lose your sight due to intraocular pressure, everything starts to go gray, right? If something is dull or dim, it's amblio. Old age, I resent this, is presbio. And the vitreous body is vitreo. So if we're gonna examine the angle of the iris and the cornea, we're doing a gonoscopy, prolapse of the eyelid, blepher, up to, up, blepherotosis. I always get tongue tied. The P is silent. So it's not ptosis, it's ptosis, blepherotosis. And vision that's associated with old age is presbyopia. Paralysis of the iris is iridoplegia a hernia of the lens, facocele, and a fear or intolerance of light. I fear, it, there is such a thing as a photophobia, which is a, you know more of a, a mental diagnosis, but photophobia from a medical perspective, people with migraines and people who have contracted a spinal meningitis will have the symptom of photophobia where the light is actually painful. They need to be in a dark room. Any disease of the retina, retinopathy, Inflammation of the conjunctiva is conjunctivitis. Everybody's heard of pink eye, right? That's what that is. The instrument we use to measure the curvature of the cornea is keratometer. Dim or dull vision, amblyopia. When the eyes turn outward, exotropia. And if we go in and excise or remove the vitreous body of the eye, it's a vitreectomy. Oops. So then we have the ears. So that's how we can, when we can hear. And it's also the thing that's in control of our sense of balance. And we have three sections to our ear, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So the outer ear is basically the part you can see, the external. The middle ear is the tympanic cavity, and that's the tympanic membrane is your eardrum. And then in, inner ear is the bony labyrinth. So the outer ear, you have the, the oracle, which is this part of the ear that you can see, the external auditory canal, which is what you can see also. If you have an otoscope, and sometimes even without an otoscope, you can visualize the tympanic membrane and it conducts sound by the displacement of air and it sends signals to the brain, right? Um, so the sound gets transmitted from the oracle to the tympanic membrane. And also there's something called cerumen, which is wax, right? And basically it's there as a protective mechanism. So it keeps things out of your ears, right? It protects your ears. In the middle ear, that goes from the eardrum or the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. Um, it transmits vibrations to the cochlea with these three teeny tiny little bones. The malleus, also known as the hammer, the incus, which is known as the anvil, and the stapes, known as the stirrup, because that's kind of what those teeny tiny bones look like. And that's where your sense of hearing actually comes from because there are um, impulses get generated when the fluid inside the cochlea gets stimulated. And what happens is that goes to the nerve that goes to the brain and interprets what it is you're hearing. <clears throat> and then there's also a connection for eustachian tube that goes right to where the tympanic cavity is and it goes to the throat. So have you ever got on an airplane and when you're taking off or landing your ears pop? Well, that's why. So that eustachian tube that actually goes from the tympanic cavity to the throat on both sides, it actually equalizes pressure. So when the pressure outside gets too great, you get that pop sound. Like you almost don't hear for a moment and then, and then you can hear again. So that's the, the pressure equalizing. And then in the inner ear, you have the cochlea, organ of cordy with little tiny nerve endings. They're called hair cells. And they're the ones that take the movements and turn them into signals that are electrical. And the signals go through the vestibular cochlear cranial nerve, which is the eighth cranial nerve to the brain. And then your brain says, oh, I know what I'm hearing music or I'm hearing Miss Mary gab. And then it also inside the inner ear, you have the vestibule, which is kind of like a little cavity that contains all the structures that help us respond to gravity and balance. And inside that are the semicircular canals. They're filled with fluid and they send information about heat and bounce also. So if you've ever had a case of vertigo, gotten dizzy, or if you've ever gone on a roller coaster, 
you know, or any kind of crazy ride, um, what it does is it shakes off that fluid up and it actually throws your balance off. So when you get off, you're kind of off kilter for a minute. Okay, let's go to the combining forms. <clears throat> so when we talk about ear, it's odo, the stapes, stapido, the tympanic membrane can be tympano or meringo. And then the labyrinth, inner ear is labyrintho. <clears throat> Excuse me, hearing is audio, that was pretty easy. Uh, the mastoid process, mastoido, and that is a bone right, right in front of you, or right behind your ear, rather, that you can actually feel. And tubes, it can be fallopian tubes in a woman or the eustachian tube, which is for hearing, salpingo. If you have discharge from your ear, that's odorrhea, which is better than diarrhea. If you are going to see somebody who's a specialist in eye, ear, nose, and throat, otolaryngologist. And then if you have a rupture of the eardrum, which is painful, by the way, tympanorexis, pus flowing from your ear, ooh, is otophoria. Not being able to hear, in other words, being deaf, can be acousis or anacousia. And if you have pain in your ear, because pain is dynia, it would be otodynia. Your ear's inflamed or an infection, you have otitis. The thing we use to look inside your ear is an otoscope. Inflammation of the mastoid process is mastoiditis. And here, this is where I left off before I got on with you guys. So we'll do these together. <clears throat> so if we're doing an incision into the labyrinth, labyrinthotomy, right? Makes sense. If we're talking about the hearing loss that people suffer due to age, it is presbycusis or presbycusia. Um, and when people get older, here's a fun fact. The thing that they actually lose first as far as hearing ability is high pitched sounds. So if you're talking to somebody who's you know, older, you know, 70s, 80s, try to lower your voice into a deeper tone and they're going to have a better time hearing you. So for girls who have that real high squeaky voice, which I don't, but <clears throat> it's very hard for older folks to hear that squeaky high voice. The instrument we use to measure your hearing is an audiometer. Let's go. And then diseases and conditions. Very briefly, cataracts. You can't miss cataracts. It's a clouding or opacity of the lens. Um, not harmful in any way. Sometimes people get them. They run in families. Um, they develop very slowly. When they get to a point where the vision is so occluded and you would see that the, the eye would look milky kind of. Uh, that's when surgery can be done to actually remove the cataract and just put it in an artificial lens to replace it. Uh, older folks will get glare or halos around stuff, double vision, um, harder to see at night and sensitive to the light, especially at night. And like I said, the, 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 the eye appears white or milky as the cataract gets thicker. So it can be corrective lenses or surgery. Um, errors of refraction, what they're talking about is you don't have 20-20 vision, right? Emetropia is normal vision. You never hear anyone say that though, but that is the word for normal vision, emetropia. That means that everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen and you can see close up, far away, the whole nine yards. Hyperopia, farsightedness, basically your eyeball's too short and the image is falling behind the retina and that's why you can't see. So, and then myopia, is nearsightedness. Um, myopia, when it happens due to age, is presbyopia, because that actually happens. You notice people like me need reading glasses when you get to a certain age? Well, that's why. And so corrective lenses, you know, to correct all those problems or contact lenses. And then we have strabismus. Um, got one crazy eye. One eye's looking one way and one eye's looking the other way. Um, and it can be one of two things. It can be esotropia or exotropia. So if the one eye turns inward, it's esotropia. If the other eye turns outward, it's exotropia. Strabismus, we already, that's what that is. You know, the, the eyes don't look in the same direction. Sometimes they'll just put a patch over the eye, especially if it's diagnosed in a child, um, to the patch over the good eye to strengthen the weaker eye, believe it or not. And then you have a baby pirate. Uh, we have glaucoma, 
Glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure and it's caused by increased fluid behind the eye. And over time, if it's not treated, it will actually damage the retina and the optic nerve and you can go blind. Um, what's happening is the aqueous humor, that liquid's not draining. So, you know, or there's too much being produced. So there are two reasons that glaucoma can occur. Uh, usually people don't know they have it. There are no real symptoms of it. There's no pain or anything like that until the very end. And then when they start having symptoms, the damage that's done so far is not fixable, unfortunately. And it's, it's an easy fix if we catch it early. Eye drops, um, there, there are uh, different types of drops, Timolol, which is a beta blocker drop. And let's see where we are. So measurement of the refractive error. So that's when you go to the eye doctor um, and they measure to see how bad is your vision? Is it 2040, 2060, 2080? In other words, how much can you see on that pretty chart, that Snelling chart from 20 feet away? So measurement of refractive error. And ectropion is where the lower eyelid or the eye is turning outward. So I'm just gonna say outward turning of eye. And then if you have normal vision, that's emetropia. And I hate the word normal, but you guys all know what I mean. You can see everything without difficulty. And cordialum, that is a swelling of the sebaceous gland. It's usually a bacterial infection. Swelling of sebaceous gland. And papal edema. What do you think papal edema is? What's edema? Swelling. There you go. So it's swelling of the eye, right? And we're usually talking about not like you got punched in the eye and you have a swollen black eye. It's swelling inside the eye, right? And that can actually cause damage to the optic nerve and, and have problems with vision later on down the road. All right, let's see what else we have here. Procedures. Now we're not going to go through tonometry and go to endoscopy. And that's the Snelling chart. That's an indication of what the patient can read at 20 feet, right? That's where that 2020 comes from. I'm not going to go through all the pharmacology because that's insane. Uh, I will talk a minute about otitis media. Media meaning middle, and that's a middle ear infection. Um, this is the most common thing for little kids to have ear infections because the eustachian tubes that they have in their ears are short and that they can get all sorts of bacteria in there that we as adults are not as prone to. Usually the kid will get an earache, um, the reddening or bulging of the eardrum when the doc looks in there with an otoscope. And with babies, they will sometimes pull or tug at their ear. And that's kind of a telltale sign. Antibiotics is usually the treatment and analgesics. Hearing loss, there are two types of hearing loss, sensory neural, which is the transmission to the brain. Those impulses are not getting to the brain properly. That can be because of old age. I resent that way that's worded. Noise damage. If you were in a band or you used to go to band, you know, go listen to music and stood right by the speaker. And then certain medications are ototoxic, a lot of them actually. And then there's conductive hearing loss. And that's usually because of either an infection like otitis or your eardrums perforated or ruptured or hardening inside the ear, which is otosclerosis. So that's something that can be fixed. Conductive hearing loss is something that usually can be repaired. Neurosensorial is usually something where the damage is done. And that's when people are constantly going, huh, what'd you say? Huh, what? Or they just start to avoid groups of people, period. Um, treatment hearing aids, which a lot of older folks, you know, don't want or can't afford actually, which is sad. Ceriamin is earwax. And remember, you don't put anything bigger than your elbow into your ear. So don't ever put a Q-tip or cotton swab in your ear, please. The word deaf means not being able to hear well enough to communicate effectively. So somebody could be labeled as deaf, but it doesn't mean they don't hear any sound at all or they may not hear any sound at all. It's a, it's a wide range. The word deaf is just, you know, inability, I'm gonna call it the inability to hear for communication purposes. 
And then when you say somebody's hard of hearing, they can hear, but it's diminished. Superative is the formation of pus. And I hate the word pus because that's not something medically that we use. It's purulent exudate. So formation of pus. Tinnitus is a ringing or buzzing in your ear for no apparent reason. It can happen for different reasons. Um, a lot of medications can cause ototoxicity and tinnitus is usually the first symptom. So ringing or buzzing in ear. And then vertigo is, is dizziness, syncope, right? Feeling dizzy, feeling like the room is spinning. And then we've got, we're not gonna go through the procedures like a meringotomy, uh, mastoidectomy, cochlear implants, the bionic ear. I love the way they call that the bionic ear. So they do have amazing technology now where they can put an implant that actually goes right to the auditory nerve to the brain. And then a microphone captures the sound waves and sends those waves to the brain so you can hear. Crazy, right? Irrigation of the ear to get out lodged in earwax. That's always fun. The Rini test is with a tuning fork and that's looking for conduction issues. So in other words, if they take the tuning fork, they put it behind your ear where the mastoid process is and ding, depending on how you can hear it. If you can hear that, you don't have conductive loss, right? It would be sensory neural. And then the Weber test, is all about sensory neural loss. So it's to determine one-sided hearing loss. And they use the tuning fork for this too and put it on top of your head to see right in the middle, which side makes the loudest sound that you can hear. And that can identify hearing loss. Audiometry is, you know, when you're a little kid and they come in with a little machine and put the headphones on, raise your hand when you hear the beep, beep, beep. Tympanometry is evaluating the eardrum's ability to move because that's how it sends signals. So measuring hearing is audiometry, audiometry. Surgical repair of the tympanic membrane is tympanoplasty. And a visual examination of the ear is otoscopy. Surgical repair of the ear is otoplasty. An incision into the eardrum can be either a tympanotomy or a meringotomy. Uh, tympanotomy or meringotomy. Surgical puncture of the mastoid process is masto, mastoidocentesis. A centesis is putting a puncture, a wound, or a puncture with a needle someplace to either draw out fluid or relieve air pressure. So it's mastoid centesis, mastoid centesis. And we're not going into the drugs. Don't put hydrogen peroxide in your ears, public service announcement. And that is the end of this PowerPoint. I am gonna stop the share. At least I'm gonna try. freezing up on me. That's not cool. So I'm going to minimize all our faces. See if it'll let me stop the recording. No.